So now we'll move on to our question and answer session. Before we start, can I ask the questioners to always start the, uh, state their name as well as who the question is addressed to, whether it's Father Robert Scott or Sheikh Muhammad Rashid. So here are a few rules that we have set for the question and answer session. Please form an orderly queue, one question at a time. Questions must be short, questions must be on topic. State your question, then be seated or go back to the queue if you have another question. No debate, no lecture, no statement, and no interrupting any of the lecturers while they're talking. <coughs> the question in line would be where the, the two brothers are standing here and here. Okay, a question. You should keep the line right now. So, um, I'd like to um, begin by thanking both the speakers for sharing their knowledge with us and um, I'd like to ask a question. Can you please take your name please? Oh, join on. And, um, okay. uh, can I please ask the question to both the speakers? Uh, for, uh, first, uh, um, I'd like to have Robert Scott to answer. And my question is, what is the religion of Jesus and what's the proof? Like, with evidence to be done, so. okay. The question was, what is the religion of Jesus yeah. and with proof if you can? I Islam. 
For the next question, please. No, that's <coughs> My name is Adrian, and sir, so can you speak up? My name is Adrian, yeah. and uh, I have a question for Sharik Rashid. Rashid, thank. You. First of all, thank you so much for uh, your talks. Can really you go straight to the question, please? Yeah, question for me. I just want to acknowledge. Uh, we really appreciate your your talks. Uh, the question is: In Surah Four, uh, I, I believe it's one seventy one. Uh, the Quran speaks about uh, that Jesus basically did not die on the cross, but somebody else was to uh, what was made to look like him, and he was crucified instead of Jesus. The question I have is: um, several commentators have several so questions to come to now. Can you uh, please state it, please? Okay. okay. Yeah. That's it. Okay. So basically, uh, several commentators. <laughs> have got different opinions, you know, the Sunni, the Shias, the Amadi, and all these things. My question would be, what is your uh, view on that? Is it also that somebody else was um, put on the cross? If that would be the case, then how is it possible, if, would that not be deception? Because if he makes somebody else look like Jesus, and it isn't Jesus, in my book, that would be uh, deception. So I would be interested in your view about that. Thank you. Our chairman didn't understand the question. Alhamdulillah, it's fine, it's fine. The brother is speaking about the crucifixion of Isa He has told me to the Messiah chapter 4, verse 171. Incorrect quotation. Reference is wrong. The reference is Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 157, where the about the crucifixion is mentioned. Now the brother says that the Quran says that there was a replacement for Isa. The Quran doesn't say that. The translators are putting in the brackets that this is a possibility. God Almighty did not say such a thing. We are told in that verse. And they said in both, the Jews, the Yahudis, they said in both that we have killed the Messiah, son of Mary, the Apostle of God. So God Almighty comes to rescue his beloved prophet and says, That you didn't kill him, nor did you crucify him. It was only made to appear so. And those who disagree in this matter, those who dispute, are certainly in a state of doubt. They have no certain knowledge. They follow conjecture. Guess what? Fiction, very close, very close. So there is no place in that verse where he says that he was replaced. Not the word of God Almighty. Certain translation tells her. The translation is not the word of God. It's not the word of God. So as a Muslim, we believe that no, he wasn't crucified. No, did he, no, did he become resurrected. God Almighty didn't allow his beloved prophet to be naked on the cross because they didn't have the decency to give you a long cloth with all the fleas passing around you, all the filth and the muck, naked in front of everyone. He didn't allow it. So, the brother, you have misunderstood. I urge you to read it again and inshallah you look at it. Can we have a question from the wing section, please? Yeah. One of the sisters asked, um, to Robert Scott. Is there a name? No, no. There's some passage in there. Okay. They, they ask, um, why do you think Jesus has never said he is the Lord or to worship him? The question was, why, is, uh, why did he say he's not the Lord and to worship him? Yeah, it's a question that um, many Muslim people have. Well, why didn't Jesus be clear in that way and just say, bang, I am God, worship me? First of all, I think we need to submit to revelation and not come with our own criteria. Um, if God was to come to earth, we need to accept what he says rather than kind of put him in our box and say he must do this or that or the other. 
whom is accept, submit to the revelation he gives. That said, the revelation that we are given here about the Lord Jesus, he does the kind of things that God did back in the Old Testament. God rescued his people from Egypt by parting the Red Sea and by giving them bread in the desert. What does Jesus do? He says he's rescuing his people by dying to take away their sins. He walks on water. He gives bread and miraculously. He does the kind of things that God does throughout the Old Testament. If he had said, I am God, worship me, at that time he would have been stoned for blasphemy. So he is subtly showing who he is, bringing up echoes of the Old Testament all the time, showing how he fulfills it. And if you have eyes to see, or eyes of faith to see, you do see it. Interesting that the first disciples do see that. And so on that resurrection Sunday, what does Thomas do when he finally realises that Jesus has been raised from the dead, showing mighty power, that the prophet didn't just get shamed on the cross, he was super and exalted by being raised Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. And at that point, Jesus doesn't say, oh no, no, don't say that. Please don't do that. He accepts the confession of Thomas. Interestingly, later on in the Bible, you do have other people trying to worship disciples. And they say, don't do that. You have someone trying to worship an angel. They say, don't do that. At no point does Jesus refuse worship to him. And if we understand the previous scriptures, the Old Testament, the prophets, we will see how Jesus fulfills all the promises, the plans, and the character of God as it comes to earth. Do we have a question from this side, please? My name is Jim a question for Rob. Uh, when you were doing part, part, part four of your talk, you said that the disciples had seen Jesus die on the cross. Um, obviously we know from Mark 14 and 15 that they, they were fled, they weren't present when he was Jesus according to the Bible of being crucified. So my question is, which of the disciples, that of the twelve disciples, were present at the crucifixion, and then which of those were going to write a gospel? The question was about Jesus' crucifixion and uh, is where the disciples saw him. Okay. Thank you. Was your name? It's nice to see you again. Nice to see you again. Um, yeah, I was reading an idea that he was put this week, and he made that great too. I think he misquoted or misunderstood exactly what's going on. So the disciples leave Jesus when he's arrested. They desert him at that point. But they reappear. So as Jesus is being crucified, Jesus' last few words are to John and to Mary, his mother, John, his beloved disciple, and says to John to look after Mary, to take her in. So he's certainly there at the cross. There are many women are witnessing. And I think in many ways that shows the authenticity of what is being said. Women were not seen to be great witnesses, not particularly trustworthy. Now, that's not right. Of course they are good witnesses, and of course they are trustworthy. But the culture of the day said they weren't. And so for women to be present at the cross on which Jesus died, as promised by Isaiah, we witnessed by Jesus, to many people you think, well, that's just not helpful evidence. But I think actually it shows it's not made up. They could have made up some impressive names who witnessed it. But these women did, and John did, I imagine a few others did too. And the, and the point of the New Testament is that it is um, given by God to people. So God says that the, we're told the scripture is God breathed. He's breathed into people and they spread it to others. So even if someone doesn't actually physically witness it, God can give them that insight, as I'm sure we all know um, from our own, and the Quran has that kind of understanding too. And also Luke's Gospel talks about the fact that he has investigated everything. He's been to the witness, he's talked about it with them. He's done his historical work. Which again, I encourage you, go away and take one of those Gospel outlines. Go away and take this Gospel in Saleti or in English. Uh, can we have a question from that side now, please? 
Uh, this is a question from uh, a sister, we don't want to disclose her name. She said, uh, this is to Robert, she said, hello Robert. I have a question, uh, there are many similarities between Christian and Islam, especially uh, we share our prophets. Uh, throughout the centuries, God sent prophets to mankind to remind them of the worship of the one God, like Noah, Abraham, Jacob, Solomon, Lot, and Moses. They all follow a pattern. Uh, either when the people reject God or they worship other forms of God, God sends them a prophet. Um, my question is, in my opinion, does Christianity break this pattern by calling Jesus and worshipping him as God? And does the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, continue the pattern of the prophets by teaching them God's message of worshipping one God and of their judgment? Why do I get the questions? <laughs> um, I think that the answer to this question goes back to how I began um, the talk. That we must understand Revelation in context. And yes, God sent prophets. And yes, he gave them a message about the one true God. But that wasn't the only bit of the message. The message was about the fact that he was going to remake the world. He was going to sort out the mess that had been created by sin. These prophets bring promises from God, saying one will come who will sort it out. Abraham was given those prophet promises. David was given um, those promises. And they were prophets, speaking God's words, calling people to worship the one true God, and making great promises that one would come who would bring peace. And so therefore, when the one who comes, who brings peace, he is the one who all the prophets are looking forward to. He is the one who completes their message. And as we understand more of who Jesus is, so we actually understand more of their message back then. And back then, their, their message about the one true God was about a God who was um, more complex, deeper than we understood. It was about a God who had a spirit and had a word. Even the beginning of creation, it says in the beginning was God, and how does what's happening in the beginning is spirit, is hovering over the chaotic waters, and his word powerfully creates. So even in the first few verses of the Bible, we have God, we have spirit, we have words that the prophet Moses talked about. And so as the sun walks the earth and does the kind of things you'd expect God to do, it made sense for those first followers of Jesus to worship him as the last sent one. The Son of God. I hope that answers your question, but I suspect you'll come back a bit more. Um, can we have a question from the sister side now, please? Um, sister Anne, she asked, what does the Messiah mean in Islam? She brought a question. The question was, what does the, what does the <coughs> Messiah mean in Islam? Messiah is a Hebrew word. In Arabic, it's Messi. Messi. Different translation, Messi. Messi, I've said in my lecture, means the anointed one. One who's been chosen to do a job, one who's been appointed. It's just a title, it's not his name. It means anointed. That's what it means. But that doesn't make him God. It just means anointed or appointed. That's it. Robert, can we get a question from this side now? Hi, uh, Paul, thank you. Um, Sorry, um, could, the, could you go back to the question, please? Um, could you please give it back to the volunteer, please? Thank you. Thank you. Um, you believe that Jesus is God? Um, can you say your name, please? Oliver Rashid and Carol. Um, you believe Jesus is God, and in the Old Testament, God is also Yahweh. So how do you reconcile or deal with the inconsistency or injustice of uh, Yahweh killing babies and innocent, innocent children and animals and all this stuff? So, you get the question? Keep <coughs> Again. Um, I could be very naughty and say, so you're happy to accept Jesus as Yahweh, but I suspect you wouldn't be. Um, 
But the question is more about the character of God in the Old Testament. How does he meet out justice? How does he do um, judgment? And, and rather than talking general terms, I'm very happy to talk about particular passages um, one-to-one. But there are passages of Scripture which talk about how God says that um, those who oppose him should be judged, should be killed, um, should be brought under judgment. And it's very clear, it's very clear, that all those people are being brought under judgment because they are worthy of judgment. They have sinned. For example, God, when he says to the prophet Abraham in Genesis 15, throughout 15, he says to him in a, in a prophecy that your descendants will go and live in Egypt. And they're going to live there for 400 years, by which time the sins of the people of Palestine, the Canaanites, would have been heaped up. And then you can go back into the land. And because their sins have been heaped up so much, the land was almost wanting to vomit them out. That's the, the language being used. And God kind of uh, makes that vomiting happen by bringing judgment upon them through the army under Joshua. Now, is that saying that God's going to do that everywhere to everyone? No. But that particular time, in that particular place, God was bringing justice and judgment on people that had been rebelling against him. And in some ways, that's actually a picture of what God will do on the last day, as we all agree, that God will bring justice and will bring judgment on those who are sinful. And those incidents in the Old Testament are pictures of what is ahead. And we should read them and think, I don't want to be like that. I want to be on the side of God. I want to have peace with him. I want to know his peace. I need to accept his Messiah as the Prince of Peace. Can we get a question from this side now, please? Well, my name is Omar, and I want to ask a question to your brother Robert. I want to ask you if, um, if Jesus was God, um, when he was on the cross, when he, when he died on the cross, um, who was running the world like, when he died? And also, um, if you do say he's God, um, who was Jesus um, praying to uh, mention in the Bible when he died? Okay. Um, can I ask a question? Uh, so it's always to restate the question. Another question for you. Busy day. Do I get paid for my question? <laughs> I can restate the question. Yeah, sorry. So there are two questions. We're kind of related, but that's fine. Um, so when Jesus was on the cross, and who was holding on the world? If we say Jesus is God, the world's going to fall apart. First question. Second question. If Jesus is God, who's he praying to when he prays? Good questions. And I think partly they're based on a misunderstanding. Um, be very clear, we do not say God equals Jesus. We are not saying that the whole totality of God is Jesus. We say that God, the one true God, is Father, Son, and Spirit. That is God. Each of them fully express God, absolutely, but no one of them is completely the expression of God. So when Jesus is on the cross, when he is dying for the sins of the world, as the prophet, Isaiah the prophet um, prophesies, it's not as if the Father doesn't exist and the Spirit doesn't exist. That's very important. They're still there. Also, it's very important for us to realise, what is death? Now, none of us think that death is an end of existence. It's not like that. Christians believe um, that when we die, there's a sense of, of sleep for the unbelievers, and souls go to be with God. And then at the resurrection, our souls and our bodies are reunited. So even as we die, there is some existence. It's not an end to existence. And even more importantly, death in the Bible is physical, absolutely, but it's more about spiritual things. So when God in the Garden of Eden said to Adam and Eve, if you eat of this tree, you will die, I guess he talked about them going to the grave. But actually, it was more expressive of a broken relationship, a spiritual death, of an eternal death in that sense, from the eternal one, a breach of relationship, a rupture in that. And Jesus absolutely experienced that death as he was forsaken and felt the full judgment and justice of God for taking the sins of the world upon himself. I think that's a timer. Happy to talk more later. Um, can we get a question from the sisters out now, please?
Um, we've got a sister from Sister Nujana. She asked to drop her membership that has the Bible changed over, over time or is it the literal word of God? So it's about the Bible and whether it has changed over time or is it the literal word of God? <coughs> My dear sister, we do find that the Bible has been changed over time. We do find that. For example, the Bible that I'm reading, the authorized King James version of the Bible, the Bible that my brother accepts is the new international version of the Bible. New international version of the Bible. Yeah? The brother has quoted the quoted Father, Son and Holy Ghost. From the first epistle of John chapter 5 verse 7. We said, for there are three that bear records in heaven. The Father, the Word and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. He's quoted that. But that verse is not in his Bible, it's in my Bible. <laughs> No, 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 there's a change, there's a change, there's a change. We don't believe that the Bible is 100% the Word of God. But you can't say that it's not 100% not the Word of God either. Because there are many things that the Bible can accept. I won't go into that. But yes, you do find many different versions of the Bible. The Duelian version of the Bible has 73 books. The King James version of the, of the Bible has 66 books. There's a difference of 7 books. What happened to these seven books? There are verses in mind which are not in Brother Robert's course. You have these. Yes, there have been changes in the Bible. And we don't we don't accept it to be the one hundred percent the word of God. Brothers, can I ask you please stand up and let's move the sisters coming because they can't hear you in the other room. So yeah, just move, move down. Move, 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 Jesus is the, the fulfillment of the, the promises. 
um, in the first part of the Bible. I think that's how he claims. Um, that's what he claims about himself. The scriptures are fulfilled in him. I think the, best, the scriptures best fits him. So he gets off to go to the, to the verse in Deuteronomy and talks about another prophet coming. Uh, but Moses says it must be, um, it, could, it couldn't be Jesus. Well, it says, raise up one from among my brothers. Um, well, how do you understand brothers? Again, in the context of context, we always explain by context, the meanings around them, not simply by the values built for the English dictionary. And just before that particular passage in Deuteronomy, it talks about a promised king. And it says the king must be from among your brother Israelites. So brothers is explained there. It's not foreigners. So Jesus was a Jew. He was a descendant um, of uh, Abraham in that physical sense. He was a descendant of David um, and of Moses as in, in terms of being a Jewish person. Which is why he fits the characteristics. Moses, um, at the end of Deuteronomy, we're told that um, no other prophet has, has come like Moses. No one who has done amazing things like Moses, and no one who has spoken with God face to face like Moses. So that's an extra criteria. It's not just that a brother Israelite, it's one who has spoken face to face with God, and one who has done amazing things like God. And again, Jesus meets both those requirements. And all of the prophecies about him being the seed of Eve, the seed of Abraham, the one who will crush Satan, the one who will bring blessings to all nations, the seed of David will be the king. And the many, many other promises all come to their fulfillment in this one person. He is the best fit um, for all these promises. Now, I know Brother Rashid said that the Bible um, has been changed. I think there's a confusion there of the translations. So I could pick up my two Qurans I've got there, Yusuf Ali, and then... Um, one from the Soas, and they disagree. It's not because they've changed it, it's translation issues, not texture issues. And also, would Almighty God allow his word to be changed? Surely that's a blasphemy of God to say that he wasn't looking one day and his word got changed. And I'm not convinced the Quran says that either. I think it says that God is all powerful and none can change his word. Can we get questions from the sister side now, please? <coughs> sister Anne uh, asked a question about the stated that surely in the Bible Jesus allows himself to be worshipped. If he wasn't God, wouldn't he stop people worshipping him? To bring our worship. So it's about um, Jesus Sister Anne, same sister who asked the question previously, correct? Sister, I don't think you understand English or my English at that. I said there is not a single verse where Jesus himself says, I am God, or where he himself says, worship me. Yes, we find statements that he was worthy. The brother said he never rejected it. I said he never accepted it. <laughs> he hasn't been accepted. No has been uh, rejected. But what you find in the Bible, these are the words of other people. Other people. I want to know what the Master says. He says in the Gospel of John chapter 14 verse 28, My Father is greater than I. He says in the Gospel of John chapter 10 verse 29, My Father is greater than all. He says in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 12 verse uh, 28, I cast out devil with the Spirit of God. He says in the Gospel of Luke chapter 11 verse 20, I by the finger of God cast out the devil. He says in the Gospel of John chapter 5 verse 30, I can on my own self do nothing. He can't do anything out of his own will. But whatever I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just. For I seek not the will of myself, but the will of the Father who has sent me. If he has been sent, there must be a sender. Look, basic common sense. If he has been sent, there must be a sender. From this statement we find that he says, Not my will, but the will of the Father. Not my will, but the will of Allah. Whosoever says, Not my will, but the will of Allah. That act in Arabic is called Aslama. Aslama, Aslama means to submit. And whosoever submits is a Muslim. So we say Jesus Christ is pure and a Muslim. Hope that answers the question. Can we get a question from this side now, please? Oh, okay. We get it. Oh, my name is Amin. My question is about Christ and Antichrist. What's going to happen when Jesus Christ comes back and he's going to do something to Antichrist? Then, or what's going to happen as he comes back and starts after the program? Both speakers, if not, then Robert's fine. 
So it's about uh, the Christ and the Antichrist. Uh, are there any uh, sisters left in the room? Uh, no, it's not. Are there sisters left in the room? No. Great question, Anna. Yeah, what's going to happen at the end? Antichrist obviously means anti Christ. The okay, anti against everything that Christ the Messiah stands for. And in some ways, that could be anyone and anything that stands against the revelation and proclamation that Jesus came to bring. But there is a sense in which it is kind of focused in on one person, if you see. The Bible also talks about that kind of person as a man of lawlessness, a rejecter of God's law. And as soon as that person appears, he's said to be judged and slain by Jesus in, in 2 Thessalonians um, chapter 2. The end of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, is all about this kind of thing. We have nothing to fear from the Antichrist, because the Lord Jesus will appear and sort him out. This is to sort out the devil and Satan, and bring us into his kingdom of perfect peace, where there is no crying, no warning, no death, where all the bad things of this world have disappeared. And that all comes around Jesus' return, because he's not only the centre of the Bible, all things are being fulfilled by him, but he's the culmination, the end point. And when he returns, this world will be wrapped up, finished. And we need to make sure that we're submitting to him. <coughs> in Islam, we do believe that there's no sister in our room, so we don't need that. In Islam, we do believe that the Isa is going to be the second appeal, that he is coming back. And just as the brothers, we do believe that he will wipe out the Antichrist. We believe that. This is a common ground, a common ground. So I don't know how to expound, expound in this. That, that's nothing. You know, it's coming back. We both believe that. I said, Alhamdulillah, that's something that we both agree. Yeah, I said, Alhamdulillah, it's nothing. You know, you're, you're probably not going to be there. I'm probably not going to be there. Let's not waste time. Next question. Right, can we get a question from this side of my face? Yeah. My name is Phil Adrian, and I'm uh, still asking questions to the state of um, The question I have is related to where Jesus is at the moment. He, according to Islam, and according to Christianity, he is in heaven, alive in heaven. He is the, the only prophet uniquely so in heaven. Now, the question is, if, if I want to go, if you all want to go to heaven, isn't it? Would it be better to ask a prophet who is dead, whose bones are in the grave, or wouldn't it not be better to ask the prophet who claims to be more than a prophet who is now alive, who is there where I want to go, who actually came from there and went back to heaven? He must know directions. The question is becoming too long. Okay. But you get my question. Would it not be better to ask him than a dead prophet? Because he's there. He should know that. So the question is about Jesus and where he is. Would it not be better to ask a prophet who is alive in heaven with God than to ask a prophet who is dead, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? That's the question, I think, right? Question. You see, it's not a matter of whether he's alive or dead. It doesn't matter. All the prophets have come to the world delivering the same message, that you believe the one and only God. However, since you want to listen to Jesus, since he's alive with God. What does Jesus say? He says in the Gospel of Mark, uh, Matthew, chapter 5, verse 17 to 20, he says, Think not I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. Law in Hebrew means Torah. He's not come to destroy that. Do not, he says, Think not I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy but to fulfill. He says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, not even a jot or a tittle shall pass away from the law. Jod is the smallest letter, it's actually called Yod, it's not Jod. Yod is the smallest letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Like in Arabic, we have, you know the Hamza? Hamza, it's like that. It says, uh, not until the Jod or Tishan have passed away from the law. It says, so, whosoever shall break the least of these commandments, given in the Torah, least, who shall break the least of these commandments, 
and teach men to do so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. And whosoever shall do these commandments, meaning abide by these commandments, and teach men to do and abide by these commandments, shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Says, Therefore I say unto you, accept your righteousness, O my dear Christian brothers, accept your righteousness, exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter the kingdom of heaven. In modern terminology, this means there is no heaven for you unless you're better than a Jew. There's no heaven for you. According to Jesus, I'm asking, how can you be better than a Jew when you don't abide by the commandments? Because the Christians tell me that we don't need to abide by the commandments anymore. That the laws and the commandments that are made to the cross, we are living under grace. We don't need to abide by it anymore. So where do you get that? So it's just quoting from Paul, Paul, Paul. A man who never saw Jesus Christ. So we say, look, if you want to enter salvation, listen to Jesus. Not Paul or the disciples, listen to Jesus. Because whatever Jesus said, it was Islam. It was Islam. It doesn't go against Islam. I said, read, go back to your scriptures. Go back to your scriptures, not what the church teaches. Go back to your scriptures. Go back, you go forward in your Imam. Okay, answer the question. Um, can we get a question for the sisters on your Facebook? Can we get a question? This is a question. This is a question for Sheikh Mamun. It's by Sister Anne. What's the point in nearly having a child without a normal conception if Jesus is just going to be a prophet like all the other prophets who will conceive normally? The question was on his uh, birth and this question is very popular. And to the sister I seem very popular. <laughs> What's so miraculous about a virgin birth, him having no father? See when I ask the general Christians, when I ask them, the common Christians, I said, why is Jesus God? The masses of Christians are telling me because he's born who has an earthly father. Therefore the father in heaven is his father. He's God, because he has no earthly father. Well, life, beautiful logic. It is beautiful logic. But the Quran answers you on that. In Surah Al Imran, chapter 3, verse 59, Allah says, Inna matala Isa, inna Allahi kamatali Adama. He says, The likeness, the example of Jesus in the sight of God is the same likeness, same example of Adam. If you say Jesus is God because he has no father, then why don't you worship Adam, who has no father and no mother? Look, logic, logic. You know, Judo, you know what judo is? Judo, when you use the opponent's strength against him. See, this is what you Muslims need to do. This is intellectual judo. You know? So, inshallah, look, it doesn't matter if he doesn't have a father. Adam was made by the father and no mother. So, why don't you worship him? Doesn't make sense. So, inshallah, you understand why this is. We get a question from the Sada, please. Come on, I'm going to jump in again here. Um, I'll speak about the rock because I think he sort of answered it in his um, talk. Um, so the question is to Brother Mamun. Um, can you please um, tell us why is um, Jesus uh, going to be coming back? So the question is on why Jesus is going to be coming back. <coughs> the Muslim and the Christian, we both believe that Jesus, peace be upon him, is coming back. We believe that. <coughs> but the Muslim, we say, look, Israel is not coming back. To tell you, instead of killing the Atma, will be rich for. No, no. He's not coming to tell you instead of 30 days of fasting, 60 days of fasting. No, he's not coming to do that. So why is he coming? He's coming to say, look, he's coming to judge you, Christian, to tell you that you're off the path. This is a certain point of view, serious. This is me being open, open. I'm not going to beat you around the world. It's true. We say, look, he's coming to teach you that you've gone off the path, to bring you back onto the path, that you started worshiping the creation instead of the creator. And Jesus says so. Look, you open your Bible. If I'm quoting incorrectly, you have every right to tell me. But for Matthew, chapter 7, verse 22 and 23, we are told, Many will say to me on that day, Jesus is speaking. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, Rob, Rob, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? Yes, my dear Christian brother there. Brother Robert Scott, Allah is doing a beautiful job in Bangladesh. You know that? Zuri people do. Helping the needy, helping the poor, closing the uh, poor, building churches, educating people, hospitals, in the name of Lord Jesus. And they perform many miracles, even spiritually, it might be. So 
So Jesus will say, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? What does Jesus say? Amazing. He says, I never knew you. I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work in iniquity. Get out of my say, I don't even know you, you evil man, you evil know it. It sounds very harsh. It does. It sounds very harsh. So I'm asking why? Why not the Muslims? Why not the Jews who wanted to kill him? Why the Christians? I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work in iniquity. In Zulu, it's a very, very powerful statement. The Sugan Gimini now is where we work with me. It's very, very powerful statement. I never knew you get out of my sight. It means foot sack. Do people know what foot sack is? You know what foot sack is? You know like in Bangladesh, in Bangladesh when you have little chicks and ducklings coming into their house and the elderly go ch, 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 and to get them out. It's like that you say, get out of my sight, foot sack. I don't know you. I said, look, why are you doing that? It doesn't make sense. Because you took him at your word. He's not your word. He's Rasulullah. He's Abdullah. He's Nabiullah, he's Rasulullah, he's Nasiullah, he's Kalimatullah, he's Ruhullah, but he's not Allah. That's what we say. He's the Messiah. Okay, that's a good question. Uh, can we get a question from Salah, please? Salaam alaikum. Um, this question is for Al uh, Pisa Ine. I'm in Allah. This question is for the Prophet. Um, it's very simple, but it's very deep. Has Christianity, as the sect, the Jewish offshoot, or the, the Jewish offshoot sect, ever existed without the notion of Trinity and the divinity of Christ? Has it ever existed in its history of evolution, history of um, being a sect and an organized movement per se? So the question was about Christianity and about the Trinity. Just before answering that, just to clarify, I said at the beginning it's important to submit to Revelation in context. Um, to the Rashid there, he didn't explain all the verses around that particular passage about prophesying in Jesus' name. Jesus says, beware of false prophets. Just look out for them. And after that he says, you've got to build your lives on my words. Because I'm the one that fulfills scripture again. We must take that on board and not just a bit in the middle. We must build our lives on him, he says. My words like a rock which will save you on the day of judgment. Are there sect? I'm not entirely sure what you mean by um, sects um, of Jews. So on that resurrection Sunday, did the disciples understand everything? No. Jesus opened their minds to explain the scriptures to them by showing how the, uh, his life and death and resurrection met the law and the prophets. And then, as we saw in John 20, Thomas says, my Lord and my God. So they immediately understand he is much bigger than the new human being. Do they understand everything? No. Because Jesus then spends the next 40 days teaching, training them. So that on the day of Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, as Peter stands up and preaches and proclaims, um, as Brother Rashid says, he does talk about Jesus being a man, but he talks about him being the one who saves and yet the Old Testament says, it's only God who saves. He says, you've got to believe in his name in order to be forgiven. So the early disciples, after this training from Jesus, when he's been resurrected, raised from the dead, showing power over death, they do understand these things, they do teach these things. They do pray to a God in heaven called Father, who sent his Son into the world, and his Spirit is in their hearts. Do we understand everything about God? No. We are finite creatures. He is the infinite creator. But the disciples understood that the person they encountered was more than a mere man. So when he calmed the storm, the disciples said, what kind of man is this? You can just stand up and say a word and the storm is still, just like that. They say, what kind of man is this? It must be more than a man. Uh, can we get a question from the sisters out there, please? <clears throat> No more. No more from the side? Okay. One more. One more? Uh, we will take two, two or three more questions because we get to wrap up soon. Okay. So this is a question to Brother Scott. 
I can't see any name here, but uh, we'll just carry on. How would you personally react when Jesus comes to correct your belief and make work purely for the one true God? So it was about Jesus and his when he comes back and I don't accept the premise of the question because I don't think that's what Jesus himself says, that when he returns, you'll be coming on the clouds of heaven as the Son of Man, as the Son of God, as the last sent one who is here to judge. And if we haven't built our lives on him, that's when we'll come a proper. He's going to come back to destroy the works of the evil one completely. He's going to come back and bring his people to be with him in a wonderful new creation. And we can be sure of that now if we're trusting in him. He will come back to bring his people, those who are trusting in his works, as the one who fulfills the scripture. <coughs> and so in a sense, we shouldn't be shocked if we're trusting in him. Um, a question from this side now, please. Thank you. This is my name is Imran again, still, and uh, this is a question for Rob. In Luke 11, 42, <coughs> after raising Lazarus, Jesus prays to the Father and him and says, I know that you always hear me. When I said this on the account of the people standing around, they believe that you sent me. In our quarter of 36, we have Jesus calling in the Lord Father of Gethsemane praying, Oh Father, if you can do anything, take this cup of suffering from me, but let, my, let your will um, be done rather than mine. And in Hebrews 5 7, we get a confirmation of this prayer. Um, during the questions days, become too long. It's 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 a question, question. So during the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up praise and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death and was heard because of his reverent submission. So the question is, did God accept Jesus' prayer or did God refuse to accept Jesus' prayer to be saved from the cross? So it was about Jesus and his prayers. Yes and no. Yes, he did save Jesus from the cross because he raised him from the dead, ultimately vindicating all the shame and dishonor that we might have felt that Jesus received. He was super exalted. He was raised from death to show that he wasn't ultimately shamed, but actually honoured. And in some senses, no, God didn't answer his prayer because the promises way back when with prophet Isaiah were that one would die to save us for the sins of the world. And Jesus knew what he had to do, and he knew his heart. He went through temptations like we would never imagine. He was tempted to the uttermost. And he never, ever sinned. I don't know about you, but I've given into temptation. I expect you have, but Jesus never did. He knows the power of temptation. He knew God's word and what he had to do. And he's saying to his father, if there's something else, but there isn't. This was the only way. Amazing, isn't it, for God to do such a thing for people like us. Um, I uh, can we get a final question from the side now, please? Yeah, my name's Gareth, and my question is for both speakers. So, um, Mamun, can you please give me one example of the prophecy of Muhammad in the Bible? And um, Rob, can you please clarify and what passage he uses? Okay, thank you. Okay, so the first one. Do you know that you're doing me, Brother Rob, is about to clarify. You put a Bible on your hand, I'll give you references. That's fine. See, first of all, of John. The brother wants a prophecy of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Because in the Quran we are told that Isa has been prophesied about the coming of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Because one of John chapter 16 verse 7, he says, Jesus says, Nevertheless I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter shall not come unto you. But if I go, I shall send him. This is the statement. It says, Nevertheless I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comfort I shall not come with you. But if I go, I shall send you. So now, when I... Is this the last question? So when I explain this to my dear Christian brother, they say, no, it's a comforter. Your prophet's name is Muhammad. No comforter. I said, right, but Jesus never spoke English. He never spoke English. Because in Greek, the word is parakletos. You know? In Arabic, the word is Muazzin. In uh, Africana, it's Truesta. In Zulu, it's Umtugaziasi. See? You've got two over 2,000 different translations of the Bible today, sir. And you have over 2,000 different words saying Comforter. He necessarily had to say, not necessarily had to say Comforter, to say he was Muhammad. The condition is, if I don't go, he won't come. 
But if I go at ascendant, so Jesus Christ so needs to depart first. Because when I ask the Christians, who is this? They say the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost. And no, he says if I don't go, he won't come. And the Holy Ghost was there before the time of Jesus Christ. You find in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1. Many times, chapter 1. We are told that Zacharias had the Holy Ghost. We are told Elizabeth had the Holy Ghost. I don't know what that means, but she had it. We are told that Jehovah and John the Baptist had the Holy Ghost even in his mother's womb. I don't know again what that means, but she had it. She had it. So look, the Holy Ghost was there, so we know it's not the Holy Ghost, it's Muhammad. But to expound on this, this one question I can speak for an hour. If the brother wants, we can decide to have a lecture on that, if the brother has time. But to now deliver you a lecture, I need a whole hour to do that. This is only one verse amongst many. There's so many in the Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 16. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 18, verse 18 and 19. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 29, verse 12. In the Gospel of John, chapter 16, verse 7. In the Gospel of John, chapter uh, 12, chapter 16, verse 12 to 14. You will find many in the first epistle of John, chapter 4, verse 1, 2, 3. I can continue in the first epistle of John, chapter 5, verse 1. And I can continue. So there's so many. But to expand such a topic, we need to make another gathering. Inshallah, maybe in the future. However, I don't think I can spend any more time on this question. I hope you're pleased with so far, Inshallah. I hope that answers the question. Um, I don't want to get all the Jews want to meet um, first, so hopefully we can see that's not pointing to anyone else but the Lord Jesus. You've got to read this verse in context and you've got to read it closely. It's not difficult to understand. I'll read it. I tell you the truth, it's for your good I'm going away. Unless I go away, the counsellor will not come to you. Okay, you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So, who is Jesus speaking to? Speaking to people called you. He's speaking on the night that he's betrayed to at least the last, his 11 disciples. Jesus has gone off by this stage. He is saying, when I go, he will come to you. You 11. He's got to come to you 11. It sounds very obvious, but it's really important. The comforter has got to come to those guys. That's who he's primarily coming to. Not to anybody else, primarily. He's not saying the Holy Spirit, this comforter has never existed before. He's saying at this point, when I go away, the comforter will come to you personally. <coughs> and that's exactly what happens at the end of the Gospel of John. Jesus says, I've gone, I've come back, and now you can receive the Holy Spirit. What happens at the beginning of Acts, the book of Acts, as these disciples, who seem quite scared, they go out and proclaim about Jesus and say, he's the answer to everything. The Holy Spirit has come on them. This comfort has come to them primarily. It cannot mean anyone that's come after the disciples have died. This comforter has to come to them. He comes to you. And he says, when he comes, he'll convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. This comfort is going to be at work in the world after that. Convicting people of their sin, showing them they need a saviour. Convicting people of righteousness. They're not righteous. No, not one of us is righteous. Only the Lord Jesus is righteous. And the wonderful thing is that we can have his righteousness. It doesn't mean we just live our own way. We are still seeking to be obedient to this. We don't reject this in any way. We seek to follow God's law, absolutely. We seek to live righteous lives because we are righteous in God's sight. And if we get the world in terms of judgment, because judgment is coming, and only Jesus provides the answer to that judgment. So that is our completion for tonight's symposium. I think tonight's gathering was a successful religious event. I hope that we can all go home tonight with a little knowledge of each other's face. Just before we leave, I'd like to thank Brother Pal Hanur for allowing us to use the equipment for tonight's event. And I'd like to call up Brother Shafinur and Humayun Yoshi to the stage for our events managers for tonight's event. Come on. Come on. Um, I hope you guys have left your email behind. Uh, we're going to try to do more of these kind of discussions because if you really look at it, in the East End especially, bringing the Christian, you know, you've got this atheist and Islam, atheist and Christianity debate happening, but no one has really brought up the discussion of Christianity and Islam. And our children, we learn it, you know, in, in terms of Ari, when we go to school, we learn in our Ari books. But I think a platform like this is perfect to bring these two religions and talk and discuss. 
and we want to really elevate the culture of discussion than the culture of stereotyping and prejudice with all the media out there. So inshallah, which means by God's will, we're going to try to do this more often and uh, bring this platform up to our youth. Because you've got to understand, those boys over there, you know, I'm going to put this here, are young people under the age of 20 who are, you know, really aware of what's going on in society. So once again, our mission is to create a culture of discussion based on the religion that we have. Not a culture of stereotyping, prejudice and judging people. And inshallah, I hope you've accomplished that. Salaam alaikum. Thank you all for participating in our project and for, to allow us to engage both communities to come to common terms and to reason together. So can we allow the women to leave out that exit and allow them to come first? Jazakallah khair, may Allah reward you all well. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. As his heart was strengthened and purified and was filled with wisdom and light on light. So the wells of Zamzam he sanctified. Oh, uh...